What's up dudes and what's up ladies? Brian here and in this video we're going to look at the glycemic index and glycemic load. I'm going to show you how each of these is derived, benefits and drawbacks of each of them, and some other factors that affect them. So what is the glycemic index? It is a way to analyze carbohydrate foods based on their impact on blood sugar levels. The GI ranks carbohydrates on a scale of 0 to 100 based on how much they raise blood sugar levels after eating. Foods with a high GI are rapidly digested and absorbed and therefore cause large fluctuations in blood sugar levels. Lower GI foods are more slowly digested and produce gradual rises in blood sugar levels. How is a food's glycemic index value determined? Well, after an overnight fast, a group of 10 people are given a serving of a food item. This serving contains 50 grams of available carbohydrates. Available carbohydrates does not include the fiber content. After the food has been consumed, blood sugar levels are measured every 15 to 30 minutes over a two hour period. These results are plotted on a graph. Next, the people are given 50 grams of carbohydrates of a reference food, either white bread or pure glucose. The same process is followed and these results are plotted. The area under the curve for the reference food is given a value of 100. The area under the curve of the test food is then calculated as a percentage of the reference food area. Whatever that percentage is, is its glycemic index value. This is how the glycemic index rates foods. Most organizations use a high, medium, and low rating scale. Carbohydrates with a glycemic index value of 55 or less are rated as low. A medium value lies between 56 and 69, and a high value is 70 or more. Now let's look at glycemic load. Glycemic load is another way to analyze carbohydrate foods. It takes into account portion sizes. While the glycemic index looks only at 50 gram carbohydrate amounts, glycemic load looks at the available carbohydrates in a portion size. The glycemic load equation is as follows. Available carbohydrates in a portion size times the glycemic index of the food divided by 100. The scale for glycemic load is as follows. High equals 20 or more, medium is 11 to 19, and low is 10 and under. Let's look at a couple of examples. Here we have a serving size of one cup of diced pineapple, which contains 19.5 grams of carbohydrate and two grams of fiber, giving it 17.5 grams of available carbohydrates. And here we have a serving size of one cup of watermelon which contains about 11.5 grams of carbohydrate and 0.6 grams of fiber. So it has roughly 11 total grams of available carbohydrates. Next, we have a serving size of two slices of white bread, which contains about 24 total grams of available carbohydrates. The GI value of the pineapple is 66, watermelon is 72, which puts it in the high GI category, and white bread has a GI of 70. I'm going to put the glycemic load calculations on the screen for you. We see that the glycemic load for the serving of pineapple is 11.55, watermelon is 7.92, and white bread is 16.8. This would put the watermelon in the low glycemic load category, and the pineapple and white bread into the medium glycemic load category. So, as you can see, the glycemic load takes into account the portion size. However, Overeating any food will dramatically increase its glycemic load. I'll put a couple of links in the description box below where you can see the glycemic index and glycemic load of many different foods. The glycemic index and glycemic load are not foolproof. Let's take a look at ice cream. It has a glycemic index of 36. Really good. A serving size of one cup yields a glycemic load of about 11.52. So a low glycemic index and a medium glycemic load. Not too bad. But why are these numbers so low? Well, when we look at the total profile of ice cream, we see it has 14 grams of fat, 8 grams of saturated fat, in one serving. So as the body digests it, the glucose release will be slower because the body has to break down the fat in addition to the carbohydrates. This gives it a lower glycemic index. Other things that affect a food's glycemic index value is how it's cooked. Any cooking will raise a food's value. However, slow cooking will not raise a glycemic index value nearly as much as fast cooking, such as microwaving. 
the more a food has been processed, the higher the glycemic index value will be. And what other types of foods it is being consumed with will affect its value as well. The glycemic index and glycemic load can be useful in relation to blood sugar level spikes. However, because the food has a low glycemic index or glycemic load value, this does not mean the food is healthy or unhealthy. The glycemic index and glycemic load can be a helpful tool in evaluating food. However, it's only one tool. Look at the fat content, the fiber content. Look at how much processing the food has gone through and how the food was cooked. One last thing. Many studies have shown that consumption of lower glycemic foods has delayed the return of hunger and decreased subsequent food intake. Research continues on that subject. As we always say here, Try and increase your whole food consumption. Try and minimize the processed foods, but don't be afraid to eat the food you love. Just do it in moderation.